Welcome aboard. Uh, I'm uh, I'm Henry Bryson with uh, Device Lab, and uh, I do have uh, I do have the A team of uh, presenters here. So if you guys remember the A team uh, TV show, uh, we had to have a leader. His methods are a bit or unorthodox at times, but he's very very effective, just like the leader on A team. I've got uh, Harsh Dawad. And then, uh, also like the A team, I've got to have a uh, I've got to have an innovator, the guy that uh, knows how to get things done, and very creative. I've got uh, Justin Barad, and uh, of course, just like in the A team, you have to have the smart aleck fellow that can uh, uh, talk his way just about just out of uh, anything, and uh, and that'll be me. So uh, format uh, format that I thought we would do today is uh, uh, let's take a couple of minutes and. Each of uh, our presenters are going to tell uh, a bit about uh, the company. So who do you work with? Uh, what does the company do? Uh, we'll tell a little story. And uh, the story is going to be something about either a project that, the, that they were involved in or a product uh, that they innovated and a little bit about what, uh, what was going on and what was important about that. And then actually uh, something about uh, uh, goals and targets. So uh, uh, what do we want to be when we grow up? And I'm going to be, I'll be Peter Pan. I don't want to ever grow up. And Ju Justin, we, we know you don't want to grow up either. <laughs> yeah. So um, um, let me do this real quickly then. Uh, device Lab, we are a medical device uh, development company focused heavily on the uh, design itself. So uh, uh, I do get to work with innovators, entrepreneurs, Truthfully, sometimes, and only sometimes, uh, large companies like uh, uh, the Fortune 500 size. So uh, we live and breathe in uh, that world of innovation. We have worked literally from, no kidding, uh, back of a napkin sketch. In fact, uh, recently, uh, one of our uh, physician entrepreneurs um, uh, had a good chat with him. And no kidding, the very first thing that he sent looked like he just grabbed a, note, a notepad from, uh, uh, from a school uh, table and uh, hand sketched something out. Written in the margins were some descriptions about uh, what this device was supposed to do and basically said, can you guys build this? And of course, uh, I, I said yes. And then uh, the technical team took over and basically said, we, we need to know a little bit more. So uh, uh, that project is actually going, uh, uh, is going pretty well. Um, back to Device Lab, been in business about 18 years, started by uh, a, an individual uh, entrepreneur type fellow. We have done things in very nearly every single part of the human body. Some things are very, very small. Some things uh, uh, like uh, M MRI uh, machine size. So uh, good, uh, a good mix of, uh, of uh, clients that we've worked with. Um, my story actually has to do with uh, one of our clients. And basically, um, we, built, uh, we built this device. It is for an orthopedic company that decided their untethering of information, the wireless re revolution, was going to be, uh, let's take the orthopedic uh, business away from, I want to sell you a replacement joint or a knee or something like that. And I want to do it once, and then I bid you, God bless you, good luck. I really don't want to see you again. Medical device companies don't like to have recalls. So their innovation was, can I actually monitor the patient post-surgery so that uh, I, I, can, uh, I can actually achieve uh, two things? The two things that I want to achieve are compliance, and the second thing that I want to achieve uh, is an outcome. So with compliance, I am going to take a baseline and consider that I've got this on uh, femur and uh, tibia, and beforehand, my, my man doesn't have a whole lot of range of motion, which is why he needed the knee replacement to, to begin with. So from that baseline, I can say my new knee, uh, uh, the new piece of stainless steel, titanium, or whatever crazy metal uh, uh, we're using or for implants today, I am going to improve his uh, quality of life. So I send him home, not just with uh, this new uh, chunk of metal, I send him home with this device with an exercise regimen. Now, what do we do when uh, the doctor sends us home with a, uh, uh, with a prescription or a regimen? And we, we lie to him. Of course I did my exercises. I don't know why it keeps swelling up. I don't know why I'm not getting any better. But, uh, uh, but basically with, uh, uh, with the, the track patch, 
from uh, consensus, I can monitor this, uh, this activity and basically say, uh, uh, guess what, buddy? Uh, I, I know why the knee is still swelling. You're not doing the exercises. So uh, patient goes back home. Hopefully he doesn't do what my original thought was, which was, I'm, I'm going to put this on the dog. <laughs> dog dog's going to do all kinds of things. But then, uh, then the readings are going to come back and say, hey, Henry, how were you able to get your foot up behind your ear? especially with a knee replacement. Uh, so, so bottom line, uh, uh, I, I do get to have this compliance. Patient gets to uh, have his, uh, uh, have his uh, uh, treatment. He does get to, uh, to get better. Uh, the outcome that I talked about, the um, surgeon, they want to know that their procedures and their surgeries are going smoothly. So as they, uh, uh, as they continue to uh, practice their craft, they get better and better, and I've got, uh, uh, I've got proof that after a certain regimen of, uh, of activity, this patient uh, is indeed getting better. The manufacturer, manufacturer loves to have a positive outcome. As I mentioned before, they don't like to have a, uh, a recall. That's, uh, that's kind of a negative thing. But also, they want to be known as uh, the provider of uh, technology or a, a therapy that is beneficial for, uh, uh, for their customers. And then finally, my, uh, my patient. I mean, as, as he goes home with his new knee, I want him to be able to take a walk on the beach with a sweetie and, uh, uh, and not have uh, knee pain and uh, actually be able to, uh, uh, to keep up. So that's, uh, so that's my story about uh, con um, product is on the market. Uh, uh, today, it is a uh, investigational type of a device. We are helping them go through the, uh, uh, the uh, 510K clearance uh, process. So it will be a regulated uh, medical device. Uh, companies called uh, Consensus Orthopedics, based up in Rancho something, uh, Northern California. I, I, go, I go to Sacramento. That's, uh, that's where I fly into when I go see them. So uh, uh, Consensus Orthopedics. And if you, uh, if you do a Google, Google search for track patch, this is, uh, this is what you'll see. Uh, device Labs input. We developed the, uh, the circuitry, so uh, we actually laid, laid out the entire circuit board, placed the components on the board, uh, we sourced the components, and uh, truthfully for engineers in the room, um, two biggest things I'm getting here are accelerometer and gyroscope, so that I can get relative angle between uh, femur and uh, tibia. Uh, there are plans to probably add additional sensors. Uh, the next one that we're thinking of actually is going to be um, uh, temperature, that, that early indicator of infection or problem. If uh, the surgery site or the, uh, the knee area starts to uh, increase in temperature, there, there might be something bad going on. And I think that's about it for uh, consensus. Uh, last, uh, last topic, um, goals and targets. Sure, go ahead. What, what was it? Uh, what Bluetooth communication? Bluetooth communication? Yep, see my uh, little blue, blue flashy light? Uh, I, I do have an app on the phone. It's uh, not, uh, not really good for a uh, presentation in, a, in a, a room this size, but uh, uh, there is an app on the phone that I can give feedback directly to the uh, customer, to the, uh, to the patient, uh, as well as uh, share that with, um, I, I call this universe uh, those that care. So my therapist, uh, uh, technician, certainly my surgeon, I can share this information with them so that he gets that compliance factor as well as the, uh, as well as the positive outcome. So would the physical therapist be hooked into this technology with a patient that's using it? Potentially, yes. Yes. And how long does the battery last? Oh, gosh. Uh, let's see. I took this to uh, Biomed San Jose last week. Still, still going strong. It is. It is. It is. Uh, it, it's not on me 24-7, but because uh, I, I put it on the dog. But uh, 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 no. It's more electrons if it's actually moving than it would if it's sitting idle. Sitting idle, the drain, is, uh, the drain is minimal. So, yeah. We've actually not done a, a battery test. Uh, uh, we, we intended this as a uh, proof of concept. Uh, can it be done? And we have proven that it can be done. But uh, we've not vetted out all of the uh, all the other parameters. So um, 
Yeah, and we'll, we'll have more question and answer later if you like, but, uh, but thank, thank you for that. Um, final, goal, goals and uh, targets, uh, Device Lab, uh, uh, privately held company, started here in Orange County, like I said, uh, 18 years ago, um, uh, about 20 or so engineers. I would like to increase that to uh, a team of uh, 40 or 50 within the next uh, 15 to 18 months. And uh, I'm actually pretty confident we can do that. Um, there's a lot of, uh, lot of innovation uh, here in uh, California. We do have clients coast to coast, so uh, uh, maybe I'll get to, uh, get to increase my uh, frequent flyer miles again. But um, that's, uh, uh, that's our goal is to uh, increase, the, increase the size of the company. Uh, actually, we, we are expanding a lot into the uh, uh, wireless space. And basically, that's, uh, that's mm -hmm. going to be our niche. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you for that, um, <coughs> Justin. So uh, Justin Barad, um, uh, he's uh, Chief Executive Officer of uh, Oso v, uh, uh, Virtual Reality. Justin's got a uh, enviable position in that uh, uh, he's taken his uh, passion and penchant for video games and uh, made a company out of it. So company, <coughs> story, and goals. You guys hear me here? Whoa, hey. Hey everybody, uh, yeah, thanks so much Henry. My name is Justin Barad, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Oso VR. Uh, we're a surgical training platform using virtual reality. I know we're in wireless kind of IoT panel here, but I'm going to make the argument that VR is a form of sensor platform. Um, so story is uh, really what we're all about. Um, when I started out way back when, I did want to be a video game developer. Um, when I was in high school, I worked at Activision. I have a game credit with them, which I was uh, pretty proud of. But um, you know, a few family members of mine got pretty ill as I got towards the end of high school, and it was sort of an awakening, and uh, I suddenly became interested, how do we use software and technology to help people and solve medical problems? So um, in college, I did biomedical engineering, and I really wanted to be kind of a zany inventor. I don't know why, and um, I didn't know what to create, and my mentor was a gastroenterologist, and he's like, well, to invent things, you need to understand the problems better than anybody, and the best way to do that is to be a physician. So I thought that sounded a little crazy, but I did it. So I am a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I went to UCLA for medical school, graduated top of my class, stayed there for residency, and then I did a fellowship at Harvard and Boston Children's Hospital. And it was during residency that I encountered many, many problems, some of them medical, some personal. Um, but mainly uh, what I noticed is that the way that we learn how to do surgery is ancient. It's based off of uh, something that Halstead came up with over a century ago. It's an apprenticeship-based model where you follow people around. Well, that works when you have a short number of procedures and you have a lot of autonomy and when you're getting a lot of hands-on time. But in today's day and age, we have this phenomenon that they're calling the training gap. So basically, it's math. The number and complexity of procedures that we need to learn is constantly going up. Yet the time we have to learn it is going down. These are due to things like work hour restrictions, which is estimated to have lost us a year of training time. And uh, some physicians are estimated to spend up to 50% of their day with electronic medical record systems. And there's a culture shift. People are aware of what surgical trainees are now, and they're not as willing to let them sort of practice on them, to be honest with you. So, I'm seeing all these training challenges, and I'm still very much involved in my gaming roots. And all of a sudden, virtual reality has this sort of like re-renaissance. There was an attempt in the 90s, but it kind of came out, and I was still very involved. So I got involved early. And the second I put on a headset, I realized that this is an incredible solution for this problem that I was experiencing. And simulation is not new in the world of medicine, but it really hasn't taken off. So why is that? Um, a couple of reasons. One is hardware-based, that simulation hardware in general has been very custom, cumbersome, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and, and limited in scope. So it's like, this is the knee arthroscopy simulator that could only simulate two procedures. It's $200,000, and there's a maintenance fee. It's just not very useful. And then there's the whole business model where simulators were being sold to hospitals, but hospitals make the same amount of money whether or not they have a simulator. W what is the value there? And it's very hard to capture that. So what I identified is that in the world of orthopedics, where I was, a big part of our training is the use of complex medical devices, which are all tied to the majority of procedures that we do. So um, I've actually used the consensus total knee implant many times. And uh, learning how to use these devices, typically you, a device company will pay for you to go to a cadaver training lab or a bioskills lab. We get to practice for one day. And then there's a bit of a gap. Typically, it's four to six months. And then you're operating on a patient. So, 
just intuitively, it doesn't seem like it's going to work too well. And it did when the devices were simpler, but now with navigation, patient-specific implants, robotics, um, even a moderately complex surgery takes about 100 cases before you reach proficiency. And up until that point, your complication rate is about 300% higher than normal. So it's with this data and knowing that 20 to 30 percent of our surgeons now are undertrained that I founded Oso VR. And, and the goal of the company is to improve patient outcomes, increase the adoption of high-value medical technology, and then provide global access, so modern surgical training around the world, which you can do with this technology now. So uh, to get towards my sort of final goal here. So Surgical training is an amazing application of virtual reality. You can scale it around the world. Uh, we did a clinical validation study at UCLA. Uh, it's yet to be peer reviewed, but it showed that uh, students trained with virtual reality nearly doubled the surgical performance of students trained through traditional means. And that was only after 15 to 20 minutes. Um, it was much more than we realized. But there's more to it than just the training component. There is a data collection element here that is a data set that we've never had access to really before, and that is the technical proficiencies of our providers. When you think about it, this is one of the most single important gaps in our data sets right now. It, um, it's, it's studied very rarely because it's a bit taboo, but there was a study in 2013 that showed that, yes, surgical skill is directly related to almost every patient outcome, whether you're talking about infection rate, revision, hospital stay. So why wouldn't you want access to that data? Because you can, if you knew which surgeons could do which surgery well, then you could just kind of assign people to these different roles. Um, so this is an incredible vertical that nobody has right now, and we're what we're setting out to do is have the largest data set of technical proficiencies um, uh, or of surgeons around the world, really. So that's the goal of OSO VR, combining kind of our medical and gaming backgrounds to improve patient outcomes around the world. Outstanding. Thank you. Mr. Dewad. Okay, so my name is Harsh Tarwood. I'm the uh, Chief Technology Officer with uh, Nihon Koden America. Nihon Koden is a Japanese-based healthcare manufacturer. We make uh, various kinds of physiological monitoring systems, neurology uh, monitoring systems. We're actually the fastest growing uh, uh, monitoring company in the US. We're with over double digits year over year. And um, has, has had a long tradition. Uh, we own about 50% of the market share in Japan for the markets we play in. And we're, uh, we have a very tiny market share in the U.S., so there's a long way to go and a tremendous opportunity. Um, so I'm happy to be here. Story. So <clears throat> um, I'll try to beat uh, uh, Justin had a very nice story, so uh, I'll try to come close. Um, so my story is a little bit personal as well as um, related to um, uh, some of the products I've worked on. My dad uh, is a doctor. And growing up, I uh, saw him. He worked weird hours. Um, he was never home most sometimes on the weekends he was out. So you could never really have a set schedule uh, with him. And I hated it. So I used to tell him um, growing up that I'll do whatever I want in my life, but I will not become a doctor and I will not work in healthcare industry. And, and, and that's how I remember um, my initial years uh, as a kid. But then as I started getting older and started noticing um, you know, the problems he had and how he worked and, and things that uh, he was doing, it, it just inherently, intuitively, I started asking myself, isn't there a better way to do this? You know, why, why can't you do these two th things together? Or why don't you have this data to make this decision uh, in, a, in a more meaningful way? And, and over a period of time, as I <laughs> now became an engineer and, and started um, looking for work, and healthcare was one of the first areas that I thought about, and, and most of my career, uh, I worked on figuring out how can we help improve healthcare by using the technology to make the jobs of the physicians or the clinicians easier. And, and uh, when I first worked for uh, Philips, uh, one of the things we did at that time, you know, the, the whole wireless space and the PDAs were just beginning. There used to be, I don't know if you guys remember, compact PDAs. Does anybody, did anybody use one? There used to be these big clunky PDAs that had, that were, that had wireless on them. I used to work for um, uh, radiology. Um, uh, department in, in Philips, and so we were trying to make uh, use the uh, the Wi-Fi capability, the wireless capabilities of the of the PDAs to see if we could do a, a slice of one of the CT scans as an example and send it over to the uh, to the PDAs for a radiologist to look at it and to make sure that if they had the right contrast in them or not, things of that nature. 
Uh, we also uh, used to do things like uh, if you if you ever go for a um, uh, if you're sick and if you have a tumor or something, when you go for a sc uh, scan, you have to hold your breath. You have to hold your breath until they finish their scans, and it, it's it's a if, you know, for healthy patients, it's not that big a deal. But if you're sick, it, it is it's it's hard. And if they move, if they if they breathe, and if there's movement, um, then they sometimes have to repeat it. So we built uh, we try to build various things around how can we you know gauge their breathing rates to see if we can you know, take the slice at the right time. Uh, and that was a couple of examples with Philips when I worked for. Um, uh, then I moved on to work for Hospira and Pfizer, and we built. Um, uh, uh, an interesting solution. The one of the fundamental problems with how uh, uh, this was, we were building infusion pumps, and and how uh, care is performed with infusion pumps in a hospital, is is the workflow of how that process works, from when the physician prescribes a medication to when uh, it is administered to the patient, how that is recorded, how uh, it is documented. Clinicians um, and especially nurses spend about 50 percent of their time documenting all these uh, details, and and they hate doing it. So we we created uh, uh, we, we created technology where you could actually automate the whole process from the time the physician writes a prescription um, to how that order gets automatically shipped to the, uh, the device that is next to that bedside. So identify the bed, identify the patient, route that data wirelessly to the device so that the device can pre-program itself, and and then allows the clinician to do their work faster. And now that you've established that connection, all the data in terms of the care that uh, the infusion that the patient's receiving is sent back, so you can automate it, uh, automatically chart it into their patient records, uh, which improves, um, and which allows the clinicians to spend more time doing what they like to do, taking care of their patients rather than documenting. And with Nihon Coden now, uh, we're doing, uh, taking the same, uh, uh, same philosophy. Uh, we're, we make patient monitors, uh, we make uh, uh, remote monitoring systems that allows clinicians and physicians to remotely monitor those patients. So we're taking that to the next level. We have, uh, we're, we're, we have, uh, as an example, we have apps on that on your that you can run on your um, iPhones or tablets uh, to be able to remotely monitor your patients um, from your home if you like to. Um, we're, we're also working on um, uh, taking this. This goes into the next goals and targets. And this is a little, uh, this is true for us, and I think it's also true for a large amount of healthcare companies in, in the U.S. Most medical device companies, when they started off, they had a core technology that did something specific. There was a device that did, measured something, displayed something, infused something, and then they all started getting called, uh, what we today call them smart devices, which basically means, while they can not only do that function, they can talk. You can talk to them back and forth. Uh, and then from that, they all realized, okay, now that we can talk to these devices, we can gather all this data. Uh, and so almost every healthcare company and every device company probably has a server in the hospital that is capturing this data that um, uh, is being collected from, from their devices. Now, the problem with all, if this is all good, but the problem is if you ask a physician uh, or a clinician, they have too much data. They don't have actually data that they can act on. There is too much of it. There is uh, lots of data, but how do I, I, I want to know only these things. I don't want to know the whole, you know, I don't have to go through the read the whole book to understand what I want to do. So this is a challenge that a lot of companies are trying to solve, and, and, and so we're also uh, um, trying to solve in that space to be able to take all this data but provide meaningful information from this data that can help clinicians and physicians make decisions not only on a specific patient but also on a population basis. And uh, we, we internally like to call it predictive health, and we're actually working on uh, various aspects that we can, we being the bedside monitor and located next to the patient, we have lots of data uh, that, that, that goes through our systems uh, from a patient. We also have, within our own company, we have various domains. You know, we have our um, uh, patient monitoring division, we have our neurology division, as a exam couple examples. And we can figure out all the, f the whole medicine is, you know, if you have a problem with your brain, you go to a neurologist. If you have a problem with your uh, heart, you go to a cardiologist. So it's all sectioned off by speciality. But at the end of the day, it's one human being, and when something happens to us, it affects the rest of our body as well. And, and I think there's opportunities to see how we can collectively look at all this data and see whether how that helps, uh, how it can help patient outcome. And I think technology has a huge role in this because it is, today we're relying on the clinicians and physicians to be absorb all this massive amounts of data and then make a call in their mind 
or uh, your user subject matter expertise to say, here's what I think is going on. And I think we can help them get better by using technology to do that. So that's my story, and, and as well as the goal for, um, for Nihon Kodan. All right, fantastic, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, next section, uh, let's have a couple of a, uh, uh, couple of panel discussions. And the fr um, we're, we're all gonna answer, uh, answer these questions and obviously um, uh, take, any, uh, take any feedback uh, from, the, from the audience as well. So uh, the first one that I came up with was uh, uh, technical challenges. So basically, uh, if, uh, if, if you've attended uh, the, uh, the exhibit floor and you saw the uh, device lab uh, booth, I've got, uh, I've got my mannequin uh, laying on the, uh, the table. The look that we were going for was Star Trek. So uh, uh, started out with a, um, it's kind of a generic uh, hospital bed, and uh, uh, we, we rendered that, and it was, uh, it, it, it was just kind of ugly. So uh, uh, our, uh, our founder said, uh, no, no, this needs to look a little, little bit more futuristic, so uh, why not make it look like Star Trek? So, so that was the concept. Uh, the intent of, the, uh, uh, of that platform is to highlight our capability in taking s sensor information that I can gather from various parts of the, the human body and then present that either on an onboard system like a, uh, like a, a panel that's uh, directly on the bed itself or I could uh, send it, like in the, uh, in the case of uh, the consensus uh, orthopedic device, to, uh, uh, to a smartphone that the patient can actually see or perhaps even uh, present it to uh, Amazon Cloud so that uh, care providers, physicians, and so on can access it. So first question, technical challenges. When we started some of these innovations, and uh, I know Do Dr. Barad for sure and uh, uh, Mr. Dawad uh, definitely can speak to this, but from Device Lab perspective, a technical challenge. Did the technology that you envision, did it even exist when you started the project? So as I said with the, the uh, Apollo bed platform, today we are limited by uh, the capability of the sensor. If I implant into the body, I can get lots of information. If I touch the body, I can get good amount of information. But uh, with regards to things that, uh, I'm, um, I think I should actually uh, trademark this now, near field, uh, uh, near field technology. So without, without touching the patient itself, I'm kind of limited on the information that I can get. So I think realistically today, and maybe across the hall with uh, the sensor people, they can, they can help correct this. But uh, uh, basically, the biggest thing I can get is uh, temperature, maybe heart rate, something like that. So if I want to have my, if I want to have my Star Trek bed that uh, I can lay down and without touching the patient, get lots of information so that I can make either a diagnostic uh, or a, a, a prescriptive uh, type of a decision, I've got, I've got to rely on the advancement in sensor technology to catch up with, uh, with that vision. So that's a technical challenge that we're facing at the moment. We have the platform, but uh, the sensor technology, um, we, we think it needs to catch up with us. Mr. Dubois, technical challenges. Did any technology not exist that some of the projects that you've been on, um, you, you needed technology to catch up as well. Yeah, so um, you know a good example is is the, just for the sensors that you talked about. Um, the sensors, if you in any hospital, if you go to, you, you know, all the sensors are wired. They're all attached to you. There's all kinds of wires that come off, and so you're that are hooked to various devices that you're carrying on yourself. And and uh, I think the. There is a lot of work being done to miniaturize these sensors um, to be able to potentially even things like bandages or st stuff like that that you could wear on, on your skin. But the biggest uh, stumbling block for this is the battery technology. How can you miniaturize battery that is small enough that can last long enough mm -hmm. uh, to provide you um, uh, to, to have enough power to be able to send data out in, in a wireless manner that you can absorb from whatever, it could be Bluetooth or mm -hmm. um, any other near field communication uh, methods. That surely is, 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 is a place mm -hmm. where I think um, there's, um, the, the technology needs to get there, and, and I know there's a lot of companies are looking at it, including ourselves. Outstanding. Dr. Barad, technical challenges. 
Uh, it's, it's very technically challenging. Um, you know, when we did start out, uh, VR was still in kind of very much the developmental prototypes phase. So to even get the level of inter interactivity we needed, we uh, kind of hacked together some discontinued gaming controllers with a headset and also experimented with Kinect and some other things that didn't work out. And it's, it's much easier now. Um, but our really, our main technical challenge is there is a conflict between sort of two things. One is usability. Can someone put this on and get through it in a sort of enjoyable way? And then realism. And where is it important to have realism for your desired learning outcome uh, in our simulations? And where is it important for it to be enjoyable and easy to use? And, and finding that sweet spot is very challenging. And then, uh, you know, much as everybody who's collecting data now, what data do you collect and then how do you present it in a way that is meaningful for people that is going to provide decision su support or some sort of uh, meaningful change to behavior or um, uh, some other, not just data for the sake of data is, is very important to us. Uh, thank you. Uh, good segue, actually. Uh, my, uh, my next question had to do with um, uh, adoption of these technologies. So we're inventing uh, things that are uh, next generation uh, oriented, but um, uh, there will be some challenges uh, with regards to uh, uh, adoption by the users. So, uh, Dr. Baraj, you've got, uh, you've got patients, you've got care providers, you've got uh, uh, clinicians and physicians uh, uh, of all sorts. What are the hurdles that um, would be needed to be overcome so that uh, OSO VR technology is uh, more widespread? I think for us, it's uh, you know we're in a good position since uh, you know they're nice to have technologies and the need to have. And the situation is so bad um, whether you're a physician uh, trying to learn how to do a new surgical technique and you've been out in practice for some time and don't really have a lot of extra time, or if you're a medical device manufacturer and you're kind of experiencing the commoditiz commoditization phenomenon and every new product you introduce is incrementally more complex and yet you have less money for training. So it's a really a, it's a terrible sort of dynamic and you're selling less and less implants. Um, so here's a solution where you can now get your training labs to be more effective for less money um, and sell your devices and have your patients do better as well. So um, for those groups, I think it's, it's definitely need to have, and I think patients also are going to want to have access to this information and know that their surgeon is qualified to do this procedure. Because I mean, right now it's, it's just pretty wild west out there. You ask your surgeon how many times they've done this and they say whatever they're going to say, but there's really no accountability there. And, you know, I've been guilty of that, too. Oh, I've done this a thousand times. Um, <laughs> nice. So, um, you know, and they're, they're just situations that you can't prepare for. Um, I don't know why, but I really want to mention this. I operated on a gorilla once. It's a great story. Ask me about it. Um, but there are these situations where what is called high frequency, uh, uh, low frequency, high urgency, where it's, it's life threatening and, uh, you know, whoever's there is there and they need to prepare for these very rare occurrences. So uh, this is definitely um, can impact people's life, life and limb. And then uh, finally, um, uh, for some of the other stakeholders, I would say for, for payers, you know, to be able to, you know, make their money go farther and, and control their healthcare outcomes and for the healthcare institutions as well. This data is, is critically important. I think once people have access to it, they're going to wonder how it ever worked without it. Yeah. Outstanding. Mr. Duwad, uh, uh, any uh, challenges or uh, issues that you had to go over with uh, the adoption of technologies? Yeah, actually, um, you know, I can think of a couple on top of my head. Um, uh, one is um, uh, to our topic, wireless uh, technology itself. So um, uh, we actually have a, a device that we call telemetry device. These are, you know, the patients wear them and, they're, and it's measuring their vital signs. Uh, uh, and they're not sick enough that they're nice to use, but they're well off. But you still want to be able to actively monitor them. And uh, so we're, we're developing these telemetry devices. The older ones used to work off radio frequency, which involve a lot more investment for hospitals to install the whole radio frequency antennas. The newer ones use wireless. Now, if you've ever uh, been to a hospital and you've looked, if, if you're technically oriented and if you've looked at their network, you know, every hospital has a different network. Every hospital is unique. Uh, the infrastructure they use, use is unique. It's new, it's old. The, uh, the bandwidth and the network availability is different. The density in terms of how many devices do they have and that connect to that network is different. The, how much noise or interference they have. You know, where is the break room? You know, where, where is the next microwave that is interfering with your data? Is, you know, it all is varies. And uh, so you really do not have a one-size-fits-all. There is no 
solution that says, hey, you know, for, for a medical device to operate, here's a standard wireless network, and everybody mm -hmm. would install this. It doesn't work that way. So you have very unique experiences with every hospital. And, and, uh, and it's even more true internationally, because there's very few hospitals that even have the capability to be able to do this, uh, to do this remote monitoring uh, in, in those hospitals. I was recently looking at one of the European hospitals' uh, fl uh, floor plan and, and their coverage map, and they basically have coverage if you're on the hallway. So as soon as you're inside the patient room, you know, you're, you're, out. Out, you're out of luck. You can't be monitored remotely. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's it's a you know, perfect technical challenge that I think the industry as a whole would have to solve, uh, including manufacturers and the hospitals, um, mm -hmm. to make this effective. The second goes around what um, Justin was talking about in terms of the data itself. Mm -hmm. There is so much data, but it's unusable. Um, and, and how do you uh, create meaningful use of it? I don't think engineers by themselves will figure out a way to create meaningful use of this. Mm -hmm. I think um, you know engineers have talent as in you know in terms of how can I look certain things, but at the end of the day, what is important? Uh, what data to look for? What data is useful in which situation? It is a partnership uh, with clinicians and, and, and engineering mm -hmm. teams. So. Uh, that's something that's going to evolve. I think it, it hasn't. It's not there where I, where it can be. And I think it's it's a challenge that um, will continue to be solved in the near future. Very good. Um, let me take this uh, real quickly on uh, uh, from device lab perspective. So. Um, we are service provider. So if this is important to my client, it becomes important to me. So um, the adoption of technology. Some of the innovators that we're working with, uh, uh, truthfully, I can I think of one in particular that um, he's he's kind of in front of the curve. The thing that he envisions is not really mainstream today. It's uh, uh, it's popular, but uh, uh, the overall use of uh, this wireless technology, uh, we're we're not using these devices the way that he envisions uh, uh, for the future. So we will have to work uh, in collaboration with, uh, uh, with this customer to come up with methods, either with um, uh, technology that we can put into the device, or perhaps even uh, some sort of uh, industrial mechanical making this thing more user friendly so that, uh, uh, so that it will be adopted. We will go through that, uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, tier, I guess, of uh, there, there will be early adopters who bought uh, who bought, who bought the first BlackBerry before you found out that there were things that were better than BlackBerry? So uh, nonetheless, uh, you, you, will, you will go through that uh, tiering of uh, uh, customer adoption. So from our perspective, like I mentioned, my, uh, my allegiance is to the client. They, um, uh, they set our direction. They, <laughs> they, they pay my salary. So, uh, so that's, what, that's what I care first. But uh, second of all, if there are things that we need to do uh, to make this technology more readily available, more adoptable, then those are the, those are the challenges that we will have to overcome. Uh, next question. Um, I think, I think you guys will like this one. Um, with regards to new technologies, uh, uh, new things coming up, uh, uh, I want to add, let me go back to uh, consensus. They, uh, uh, they're adding something to a procedure that's been, been around uh, for a long time. Um, who pays for it? Mr. Dewad, who, who pays for the <laughs> things that Nihon Koden is making you develop? Well, uh at the end of the day, I think the, the consumers end up paying for it because the hospitals who mm -hmm. are m most, our consumers are hospitals. And they buy most of our products that we develop. And, and I'm sure they, in the end, are charging um, the insurance companies to all the individuals who, mm -hmm. um, uh, who pay for it. But it, 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 this is a, uh, and, and this is where, uh, you know, in some sense, technology is trying to help today, which is to figure out, you know, how can you accurately indicate what actually was, uh, what, was the what was the delivery of care, how it was delivered, when it was delivered, so that you can more accurately get reimbursed, because um, um, all the hospitals are you know, fighting for the same mm -hmm. pie. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, it is the consumers are paying for it one way or the other. E eventually we will, eventually we will. Dr. Barad. Um, obviously the same thing uh, holds true in terms of uh, how the money flows, but um, you know, for us, like I said, what we identified early on is, is what is, where is the key value proposition for simulation? 
Um, and for medical device companies, it's really life or death for them. Uh, they have these new higher value technologies that people can't use because they're too complicated. So they need to be able to train their users how to use these technologies. And this could be Johnson & Johnson, Smith & Nephew, these major companies, or even really any startup. And you ask any medical device uh, sort of surgical implant company what their top three problems are, I guarantee although, you know, two of them are training your surgeons and training your sales reps. So training is a huge problem that uh, is really impacting the industry. And I think that solving this is really going to unlock sort of the next stage of medical device innovation. And I think this is one of the reasons why we're seeing a third as many medical device startups as we were a few decades ago. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, let, me, let me take this um, um, from, uh, from uh, this, uh, the consulting perspective. And basically, uh, I, I look at this uh, ecosystem. And I've got, uh, uh, I've got patients at the end that need uh, care of some sort. I've got uh, providers whether they be uh, technicians, therapists, uh, 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 surgeons, or internists. And then I've got, uh, I call this one the deep pocket, uh, the payer organization. And basically the, uh, the ecosystem that I see is that if it is more efficient and if it is something that can provide a better standard of care uh, for the patient, then the one that has the most to benefit is going to be the one that uh, is going to bear the cost. So as an example, um, let's not do orthopedics. Let's do uh, something really nasty like a, a, a heart, uh, heart valve replacement or something like that. If it would be possible for the payer organization to, uh, uh, to have a, uh, uh, a device that would monitor patient vitals, then I could give a better standard of care to the patient because after he goes home from a heart surgery, um, in order for me to bring him back and do the barrage of tests that I need to, in order to tell him, good job, you're doing the, uh, you're doing the, uh, the treatment correctly, uh, we'll, see, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, instead of putting him out uh, uh, either time or expense of uh, coming to see the, uh, uh, the clinician. Instead of the clinician spending time to do whatever they do, and um, uh, tell me how, how many people would be involved if uh, you have a follow-up visit. I've got a receptionist, I've got a, uh, a technician of some sort that's going to uh, administer uh, leads or take vitals or something like that probably have at least uh, one, two, or 15 people uh, handling uh, the insurance claims. So if I can consolidate that a little bit, bring it down uh, uh, to a more manageable number, then I could take a cost out of the overall procedure and do, do my two, two things that I was looking for before. I can give a better outcome so that patient has a better quality of life, manufacturer doesn't have uh, issues with their products, and then uh, uh, basically, I've got uh, uh, I've got compliance. These things are working the way that uh, they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. So, uh, write your congressman. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, let's do one more. Um, um, Harsh, you mentioned uh, uh, the um, uh, connectivity and uh, the various uh, various different environments that exist. So, uh, just talk for a second about uh, how. How, how do we think we could overcome this? I've got, uh, uh, I've got Android. There's probably more Apple uh, uh, iPhones uh, in the audience. But we need to talk, to, we need to talk together. So how, how could we overcome that? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, I think this is also um, you know, a question of in term, you know, expertise in general. So most medical device companies are not going to be experts of wireless technology. You know, they're, that's not their bread and butter. They're probably very good at certain technology that, they're, you know, that they know and they're using. And then this wireless piece or this networking piece is sort of an add-on to it. And, and as, as I described before, every hospital has a different environment. Every, um, uh, every region has a different environment. Internationally, every country has a different environment. So it, it, is, it is going to be... It's it's and and however hard we try, we're never going to be as good as Cisco or Apple or, or Google, who make millions of these products. So in some sense, I think there is um, there is some benefit to if if if, if we can leverage um, off the shelf uh, equipment that have sort of solved this problem for us. Um, I can guarantee you can take your iPhone or or, or Android or a standard la uh, laptop and walk the walls of the hospital that device will connect better and perform better than most other medical devices. 
because each medical device has built their own proprietary wireless solution mm -hmm. inside it. And even though they've tried their best, they're never going to be as good as the ones that have, con you know, have sold millions of these and have, have had so much time to figure out you're learning. There's there's no perfect solution here. So you implement something, you, you discover you encounter problems, and you, you you learn and you solve. So there is a lot more adaption of um, these um, standard frameworks now. Where like if you were to uh, you know um, uh, last I uh, I read somewhere like on on the the Apple uh, App Store, I think there's about fifty thousand health related apps or something like that. So. You know, it's it, it's certainly growing, and I'm sure none of those companies that did those apps had to worry about wireless technology or how do I implement wireless on it because it came standard with the with the device. Mm -hmm. So I I I you know I think in, in, as um, traditionally uh, the medical device manufacturers have been protective of having this technology run on their platform, their hardware, um, and I, but I think as as this industry op gets opened up. Uh, you will have more and more new players will come in and say, well, I'm not going to build my own proprietary solution. Mm -hmm. I'm going to figure out a way to uh, connect using off-the-shelf hardware. Uh, it's it's going to change it. So I think we're, we're in that stage. We're just about probably um, at a stage where it's slowly moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. still not there. Mm -hmm. um, but I see more and more adoption of the standard off-the-shelf hardware uh, that has kind of solved this problem um, rather than building on your own mm -hmm. uh, new venture. Right. Um, if I may real quickly bounce on that, uh, so as I mentioned, we work with uh, the innovator entrepreneur um, uh, company that says this is the device that we want to build. So they set direction on, uh, on what that platform is. So if they say it's the iOS uh, operating system or the Android system or Microsoft Windows, then that's the, that's the drum, uh, that's the beat that we have to, uh, have to march to. Um, there are some uh, uh, some companies that we work with that do try to come up with uh, uh, either that uh, proprietary. It will only work on my system, uh, and they accept the risk. It's uh, uh, it's something that uh, uh, if this tablet only works with this uh, particular tool, then yes, it'll work, but um, uh, not very transportable, not very uh, uh, open to communication with the rest of the world. So. Um, uh, from our perspective, we march to the beat of, uh, uh, of the customer, but uh, we do have the eye open towards if you want to be a little bit more flexible, you may want to consider something that's a little bit more open source or perhaps developing, uh, uh, developing a, uh, a translator of some sort that lets it talk to other platforms. Uh, Justin, in, in your world, you developed uh, uh, OSER VR. Um, single platform, multiple platforms? <clears throat> um, you know, we're hardware agnostic. Uh, you know, we, we make, uh, you know, like Harsh was saying, uh, we utilize off-the-shelf hardware, which has been really what's been a big game changer in this space. I think, you know, for us, there, you know, uh, what would be nice would be having access to patient data and being able to tie surgical skill with patient outcomes. And that's something that is just so not easy to do right now mm -hmm. for anybody, um, you know, and just as a physician, the, the lack of interoperability is just such a huge issue um, right now for, for technology and patient care, and it's just, it's, it's impressively cumbersome. So mm -hmm. it's definitely a problem that needs to be solved, and there's certainly people that are doing it, but um, everything seems like just a huge Band-Aid to, you know, mm -hmm. what is kind of the elephant in the room. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes left, uh, so uh, question and answer. Uh, I hate that we are standing in front of lunch, so please don't use this as an excuse to not ask any questions. <laughs> so if you do have questions, either for uh, Dr. Barad, Mr. Duad, or even uh, consulting guy in the, in the room, feel, feel free. Yes, sir. Sure. So from the uh, consulting side, yeah, uh, that, that's, uh, that's a spot on uh, question that we wrestle with all the time because we, we can develop novel, novel new methods of doing things, but um, um, 
Last time I looked, uh, Device Lab was not a nonprofit company, and neither does, uh, uh, does my boss have the uh, unlimited uh, funds to fund development. So we do have to find, in fact, uh, uh, one of our clients recently spoke about having, uh, the sp they called it the sponsor. So if, uh, if we could develop jointly with them a uh, smack daddy new fantastic uh, training tool, but uh, uh, together we need to find somebody that will fund it. So um, um, I have to do a lot of uh, have to do a lot of hunting. I have to do a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, selling selling of uh, the uh, the benefit and uh, who who gets what out of this technology. So that that's that's our perspective, uh, Justin. Uh, I mean, from the physician's perspective, I can just say that, you know, you, um, you know, I think we were talking earlier about some user-centered design and really understanding the stakeholder issues, uh, minimizing the need for behavior change and, you know, practicing need pull instead of tech push and really solving a big need to have problem and not a nice to have technology that you found a niche application for. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Harsh, anything to add? Yeah, just to add, would be I, mean, I think the key would be to to uh, to identify what is the value add um, for the customer. Uh, I think the the hardest part about a lot of these things are conceptually they sound great, and how, but how do you specifically identify what is the specific value add that that'll immediately help them? Uh, and I think that's where most of the real work is in, in in terms of getting more adoption. If they, if if a hospital or a whoever it is, if, if a healthcare provider or customer understands, here's the actual value add, and here's my current method, and here's the actual value add based on this new technology, then I think they'll be more open to adoption. Um, and it is something that I constantly, uh, um, you know, in, uh, I work with, and I, um, I'm sure every company has a marketing team and a commercial team, so, um, and from, from being the head of engineering, I, I actively work with them all the time and say, hey, here's a cool idea, here's, you know, but how would we sell it, and, and how would we, show there is um, uh, active value to the customers. And also having some right partners also helps. Uh, if you have customers, like in, in, in our world, if, if there's a hospital that is willing to do certain things and we go to them and say, hey, we've got some new idea, we want to try this out, you know, do you want to partner with us? Uh, that's also works, uh, so then it becomes you learn together um, as part of that process. Good, good. Any others? At least one more. I've got a quick question. Yes, sir. Um, just curious if uh, maybe some of the speakers can talk on software validation and the security measures that must be taken for a device that's a smart device to, to, uh, to make it through the regulatory hurdles. Okay. <laughs> Harsh yeah. your world. <laughs> Very good question. Um, it, it's the the world itself is changing rapidly uh, in this space. Uh, pre, you know, I remember a few years ago, especially if these devices happen to be FDA approved, uh, we hardly used to get any questions from the FDA on um, uh, you know thing, how do you upgrade the security of the device, uh, cybersecurity implications. But it's it's no longer the case. They actively ask a lot of questions. Yeah, so it is it is something that. Um, we, uh, as a team, have had to learn. Uh, most um, software development teams, uh, my, my, in my experience, most software development teams in, in a, a typical medical device company are not going to be extremely familiar with the security aspects of it. You know, they're more focused on how do I connect data A from data B and how do I send this back and forth versus what are the security implications of this. So uh, we, we've had to learn um, some from the experts. There are now um, software security firms, uh, third-party security firms that uh, are offering various services around this. We, we also work with one. Uh, and, and so we're learning that. But there are certain standards uh, that I think are currently becoming accepted as, as, as what's required. You know, things like you have to be able to do data integrity checks, effective data integrity checks, which are much more than what used to be the standard, like, you know, checksums and things of that nature. So you have to, if you're doing, if you're allowing network-based upgrades of the software, if you're allowing network-based uh, settings um, uh, to be set for your device, you have to, f you have to show how you're going to protect that data, how you're going to verify that it's the right data. Um, uh, and so, and have as part of your design uh, history file have documentation that that shows how would how would you do that? 
Um, also, um, I mean, this is uh, also from a security standpoint, most hospitals will ask you now if you support in networking and any wireless uh, communication, they're going to ask you various uh, questions. Generally, you'll have a long questionnaire that talks about what security protocols do you have? Do you support encryption? Do you support encryption during transmission or, or at rest? Um, and how do you um, ensure, I mean, it's not just about the product itself also it's also about the process of how do you handle information if you are uh, if as uh, if you have hospitals as your customers most likely some of the hospitals have given you information on how to log into their systems remotely as an example if you have to log in remotely and do certain things um, the ho in, you know hospitals will ask you questions like what is your process what happens if an employee leaves who has this information do you have a process in place and how do you handle that situation <laughs> So uh, it is a ever-evolving uh, process. Um, so I think, you know, as I said, the key points end up being the, today data integrity, encryption, um, your level of how do you, you know, uh, how do you set pass passwords and whether they are configurable versus hard-coded, things of that nature. Uh, and and I've seen a lot of questions from FDA around these topics recently. Mm -hmm. Justin, you yours is a software product. That's true. Uh, you know, the data we're working with is sensitive, not as sensitive as patient data, but um, you know, our, our main concern is really uh, kind of access, like who gets access to that data. And mm -hmm. you know, we work with various device manufacturers with their proprietary technologies and their customer data. So there's a lot of privacy concerns in terms of who can access what and where. So user control is our main priority. Um, in terms of our systems getting hacked and people being taught to do procedures incorrectly, I don't know if that's happening anytime soon, but it certainly seems possible. And we do validate that, you know, our software works mm -hmm. uh, clinically and that, you know, we're teaching people properly, mm -hmm. uh, both within the regulatory departments uh, at the companies we work with and also in our own studies. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, if I may hit that just uh, very tactically and uh, pointedly, uh, uh, basically from our perspective, uh, we recognize there is a specification. This is what the software is supposed to do. Uh, there will be a uh, verification protocol that uh, uh, if this, then that, and here's the outcome. And from, from this side of the fence, uh, we just execute to make sure that it does what it's supposed to do. Uh, if there is a, uh, the unforeseen uh, 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 error or the unforeseen uh, circumstance, then we, we, ra we raise the flag and then basically have to take it back up with uh, the uh, the client to say, do you want to change this? I don't, I don't want somebody from uh, from Malaysia taking over my uh, surgery system in uh, in San Francisco. Okay, Heather, two minutes. What do you think? You have to get downstairs for lunch. All right. Thank you for attending. Uh, I appreciate the time. Uh, come and see us again.